Good morning, everyone. I'm Pat Mitchell, and it's a great pleasure to be able to moderate this session this morning, facilitate a discussion about women decision makers and their impact and contributions to the global economy. And we begin our conversation with someone who is herself a case study in women decision makers and women who have made a great contribution not only to their region, but to the whole perspective on women as leaders throughout the world. Please join me in welcoming Her Excellency Sheikh Alubna Akasimi. A familiar face to many in this room. Sheikh Aludman, not only did you rise to the top of the technology sector, uh, already a sector full of challenges and barriers for women, then you became the first woman minister, I think having held three ministry posts now for the UAE. Can you share with us the personal strategies that allowed you to navigate through the obvious challenges for women in those fields and in government, but also the additional challenges of being a woman in a Muslim region. Thank you, Pat, and good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think the first challenge came um, uh, having decided to be a computer geek at the age of 17 in the mid-70s in the United Arab Emirates. Even uh, aspiring to get a scholarship for the, go for the government was a very strange and peculiar request. Um, you don't see even men uh, asking for um, education and technology. But having um, uh, achieved a, a, a degree in technology, um, it was much easier for my family to say, um, go get a job with the government. Uh, it's very easy. You can work in finance. I'm saying, no, 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 no. I like technology. I'm a geek. I want to be a technologist. And Based on that, it was very difficult at the beginning just to convince everyone that uh, this, is a, this is a field that's going to grow. And um, it was very hard for people to take on um, uh, acceptance of decision making in technology. For example, you're telling uh, companies and government uh, entities how to operate their business. Although it's a, it's a technology based, but you're telling them how to transform their businesses. They have to trust you. Yeah, they have to see a side of you that says, it's okay, yes, I can believe in what you say and things will change according to your computer system. But in order to do that, you have to listen to the business first. For me to uh, acquire trust or get a trust from anyone in any business or any organization that I worked, I had to listen to them. I have to understand their, their business uh, requirements and I have to speak their lingua. And um, I have to demonstrate by at least a quick win of delivering a, uh, a computer system that they can see benefits from. But unless you actually work toward um, achieving that trust based on um, accomplishment, no one would listen to you. And this is not to do with women. It's a challenge when it's a new field and a woman is doing it. But in general, this is a basic concept for any business you do. So that really was the first step in, in, in gaining trust. But you have to be patient. You can't just go there and tell people, you know, I can do it. Uh, I'm the one that can do it and not you. And you were on a personal level changing perspective, changing perceptions, fighting stereotypes. Um, and, and yet you have seen progress, you, you yourself going all the way to the top of the CEO position. And now in your position as the Minister of Development, how do you assess the opportunities for women and how do you make the argument that we've heard so many times over that economic prosperity in all regions is directly connected to the economic equality for women? Women, exactly. I'll say a basic statement. One. Every society uh, constitutes from 50% of it being women, but we do not forget that they raise the other 50%. We, we raise children, whether they are girls or boys, um, and uh, many times people will say, you know, it's a man and his attitude, but that man was raised by a woman. So unless we go to the core of the understanding how a family or a mother raises her children, understanding equality at the core, um, it is very difficult to try to justify that uh, years later and saying um, we demand this. So it is a, a responsibility that's shouldered, uh, shouldered on, on the women. 
In terms of the United Arab Emirates, I think there's an exceptional story that we have. We are a small society, 80% um, of our population are expatriate community. So the need for both men and women um, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, is a must for us in terms of uh, employment. Uh, but if we look, one of, the, one of the greatest things that has been uh, done through the Emirates was really mandating education for women. So literacy is pretty high for women. It's one of the top worldwide in terms of country ranking. But in addition uh, to that, um, we say that uh, every great man has a great woman behind him, while every great woman has a great government behind her. And I say that because for us, and it's very interesting because this is very unique, um, whenever there is an achievement of a woman, it doesn't matter what field, it could be shooting in sports in the Olympics or something, this becomes a celebration for everyone. And it starts with the government basically endorsing that and saying good for her and good for us. It's a small society, and, and the drive for this, believe it or not, our prime minister's office actually has more women working for him than men. If you go to the university enrollment in the UAE, there's 77% enrollment are women at the university level. So it, it is, it's an exceptional society, but I think because we are small and well-managed. I think you are an exceptional woman, Jake Aludno, <laughs> but it, and how exceptional the government recognizes that, too. We're going to be joined by some other guests to continue this conversation. I'm going to ask them to come on and join us now and introduce them very briefly, but their full biographies are available to you. Dr. Erwin Jacobs is the founding chairman and the CEO emeritus of Qualcomm. Hala Damastir is the founder and chair of Sister Capital. And Arnie Sorensen is our host here, is the president and CEO of Marriott International. So each of these um, panelists have had personal experiences both in promoting women within their own companies and within their enterprises and also recognizing the need to invest in women, which as we have all seen over the past couple of years, so much data, so much research indicating the bottom line um, that women bring to the profits of a company and to the improvement, as you suggested, to family and economic prosperity as a whole. So Dr. Jacobs Qualcomm has led the way in many very specific strategies having to do with promoting women, investing in women within the company. Can you share some of those with us? Right. Actually, there are many women studying in biology these days, studying uh, science, but only about 18% studying engineering. And so one of our problems has been to identify and attract enough women to the company. And I'm afraid we really haven't been successful in getting our own percentage of engineers, women in engineering, above that 18%. And so that is an ongoing challenge. One aspect of that is training more women, encouraging more women to go into engineering when they're in their middle schools and high schools seems to be the key aspect. And so one of the things Qualcomm did was to set up a charter school system, now about 5,000 students, called High Tech High, and encouraging the students to go into the high tech area. And they're selected by lottery, but 50% are women, 50% men. It's been very successful in the sense of most graduating and then going on to college and about a third are studying the STEM, and about half, about the same percentage with women. So we're making good progress as far as trying to fill that pipeline. One interesting aspect of that, uh, there's a first competition on robotics, and the High Tech High just won the Chairman's Award in the international competition, and I'm told that the women at High Tech High actually led that effort. And so now our problem is to encourage more to come into engineering. We have many outreach programs ongoing. Within the company, it's interesting that you have some policies that you'll have top down that management suggests, how do you encourage innovation among the different groups? 
But there's also the bottom-up effort. And so there's a program called QY's, Qualcomm Women in Science and Engineering. And that was set up by employees to provide mentoring, to provide encouragement, not just actually in the US, but in all of our various locations. And so if you give these kind of freedoms, et cetera, encouragement, many things happen. And again, some you can plan, and others are, and often the best ones, are unexpected. Thank you, Dr. Jacobs, because you, you refer to the two very important avenues to change, starting from the bottom up, filling the pipeline, and then making it clear that women can make it all the way to the top. Halla, in your work in Iceland, first at Ardu Capital, where you and partners were asked to step in and literally retrieve a country from the brink of, of bankruptcy, um, you brought another dimension to this conversation about women decision makers, and that was the dimension of women actually bringing a different point of view and different values in making decisions about finance. Can, can you explain what, what were those values on which you based uh, Ardo Capital and Al Sisters Capital, and what difference did it make? Well, yes, I'm a big believer in getting women around the decision-making tables in the boardrooms and also in charts of money. Um, and I think gender balanced boards is the way to go. So when we founded Outer Capital, we said we wanted to incorporate more feminine values into finance. Now that does not mean that there's something wrong with the masculine values, it's just that it's excessively on that end. And we think women bring different perspectives and we think at the risk of stereotyping that men are like this and women are like that, we believe that balanced teams bring better debates, talk about things differently, bring different things to the table, and we know now from plenty of research that that delivers to the bottom line. So as much as 50% higher return on equity when women sit around the board tables in greater numbers rather than in less numbers. So to me, this is commercial first and foremost, but it's also about bringing other issues to the table. And we know women bring environmental issues, social issues and governance issues to the table. We know this from research already. So. Um, I've been a big pro proponent for this for a long time and from the educational platform, but I've come to learn that we have to get more women behind money, if you will, in charge of money in order to change things because money makes the world turn around. And of all the institutional money in this country, only 2.6% is managed in the hands of emerging managers, women, minorities, and new managers. So 97% is managed in the hands of uh, um, white men, and uh, I think the systems and everything we've seen in the world has uh, proven that we can probably do better. Uh. It, I, that would seem to be without question, we could do better. But, but Hala, in doing better, uh, is, is the barrier still the way that women themselves in some ways look at finance and, and still think of it as not their arena or area, uh, something you referenced, or is it um, literally that there are still true barriers to entry? There are true barriers, and they're, most, they're both internal within women, and they're also in the systems, in, the, in, in, the, um, at, you know, in all systems, educational system, the financial sector, and the political system. But I am actually a big believer that inclusive cultures get built by putting balanced genders around the decision-making tables. And inclusive cultures is where I want to go. So it's very much about gender balance. I don't think men are worse or women are better, but I think balance is better than lack of balance. And I come from a country that almost went, well, it pretty much went under, the entire financial sector went under, uh, I think as a consequence of sameness. Uh, we had very much one gender, one age, uh, one national background, the same school systems. You know, we did not have diversity in the boardrooms at the time, and no one dared to challenge where we were going. I think we are in such dire state in the world today that if we continue that way, the world or Europe or is going to drive as far off the cliff as Iceland did. And I'm a big believer in building the world differently. Thank you for those comments and for your work. And I want to come back to some. You wanted to add something, Sheikh Alivna. Women, I think, complements in any environment of culture. and. Uh, uh, there are uh, certain cultural behavioral uh, aspects of women in management, decision-making, as well as men. You can't have one and not have the other. 
but uh, women bring to the table a family aspect, this association of um, compassion, certain exceptional decision that they can come up with. Um, sometimes it's very hard for the man um, to bring it to the table as a CEO. And part of it is not that he's not capable of, but it just they don't see it as part of their, they think it's a soft side of them. But sometimes um, um, I, I, I believe that the, the women um, brought uh, a, a lot better values in the men within the men themselves because they feel that this is okay um, compared to where earlier they won't do that. And I'm sure we'll have some uh, further discussion of that. Thank you for adding that point. So Arnie Sorensen, you work in a, a lead a company where clearly the value of women's been recognized and your company's been recognized as one of the best places for women to work, one of the places that's best for working mothers, one of the, one of the places that has looked in its own workforce and its own pipeline and promoted women from within. What strategies have caused that to be so successful? I think it's partly just who we are. Uh, thank you for those great positive comments. But uh, we are a company that's in the business of welcoming people to our hotels. Uh, we have had for decades a philosophy that we can provide a genuine welcome only if our people feel like they love their work. Uh, and that aspect of welcome and of sort of global opportunity is something that has caused us to invest in all of our people. Uh, and it's, it's, I think, easier in some respects for the women leaders up here to talk about differences between gender types. I won't go that far. Uh, but what we do find is that uh, women growing in their careers appreciate their work. They're motivated. They're great leaders in our company from the top to the bottom. I've got uh, three great leaders here with me this morning and, and one bit of advice and suggestion to everybody here, don't forget the power that an individual, uh, maybe at the top but maybe deep within the company, can have to cause change by advocating their position. And so we listen to our leaders and we listen to uh, very senior and fancy leaders but we also have 3,800 hotels around the world in each one of those, there will be women leaders. Uh, and in that environment where they sit, they are big leaders. They may not come necessarily to the Marriott board table, but if we can have them also take ownership of building the careers in the folks that are in their hotels, uh, building careers for those folks even beyond their hotels, working in their communities to uh, find uh, diverse supply sources, uh, working in their communities to work with the schools and do the other things. All of those things sort of feed together to a place where the, the global diversity agenda, including very much women, uh, is simply part of who we are. I want to come back to the um, going for women-owned enterprises and how that, too, helping women entrepreneurs navigate and find their way is, is a part of a company's commitment, too. But within your company, with such a large workforce and such a diverse set of skills, how do you um, assess the difference in the contributions that women at the table are women leading the conversation and making the decision makes for Marriott? I don't, um, and maybe that's not the right answer, but, but of our senior leadership, we think we're about 35% or so are women today. Uh, sitting and looking at our, my direct reports, uh, we are building our rank of women leaders in that group. Uh, and their contributions, woman to woman, are very different one from another based on their expertise, based on their personality, based on their global mindset. Uh, I, we get value from them, there's no doubt about that. But I, I wouldn't sit in that room and say, I get X from the men and I get Y from the women. Uh, I would say, I get A from her and B from him and C from her and D from him, et cetera. And to make sure that through that uh, mix of viewpoints, and gender diversity helps that. I'm not, I'm not by any means suggesting it doesn't. But the diversity is much broader than just gender, and it is also about personality and expertise. Dr. Jacobs. Right. It's um, been an interesting situation uh, at Qualcomm. Uh, we recognized a while back that the number of cell phones in the world, number of wireless connections in the world is going up something over 6 billion out of 7 billion, about 6.6 .6 billion connections right now. And so one of the things that we very early tried to think through was how to make better use of these cell phones, which are getting smarter and smarter, of course, 
for various social causes. And we set up a group called um, Wireless Reach, which now has over 80 projects in over 30 countries. Interestingly, most of the women make, most of the people making contributions, coming up with a lot of these social ideas, where might we do better, are, are women. And in fact, the group that I'm with today, mostly from the Wireless Reach group, are, are here are women. And they do bring a very different perspective, thought pattern, et cetera. And then when it's, things are suggested, we can rally around and try to press ahead. There was a reason that the funds were given first to the women uh, in the villages and the rural areas, because they, they knew they would get the, the word out, so the communication would be intact, yes? Right, we had a, uh, one of these programs was a microfinance program for women in Indonesia. And the original idea was a village phone that we would provide a box with a phone, with a battery, with a larger antenna, with an agreement with a cell phone company, and of course with marketing materials. And the women would buy that and then be able to pay that uh, back. And that worked very well for about a year and a half, two years, uh, where they were simply selling the time. But of course now, just about everybody in developing countries as well as developed are, have their own cell phones, so selling the time was not enough. We began to look at how do you expand that and add additional capabilities to the phones, things that they may be able to do that women themselves were suggesting because they became excited about being able to support their families uh, better and uh, be they became very entrepreneurial. And so we got back a lot of ideas. We were able to implement those as applications, make those available, and that program continues to expand. Um, I just wanted to um, emphasize one point with the uh, microcredit programs uh, for women and villages. Um, the, the, the part of the microcredit finance is they, it lacks collateral commitments. There, there's nothing that comes out of the individual for this loan. And the reason it actually extremely successful amongst the women in these villages, um, uh, over 90%, I think, of the participants in these programs were women, is the women honored that debt and they, they actually put the loan or the money back uh, into the bank. So um, their collateral was actually more of their credibility and their commitment to put the money back. And that's also another element and value uh, in terms of the finance in relation to women. And, and it's one of the differences often pointed to as well. So, Hala, coming back to your point about believing that in boardrooms and, and across every part of a business community and a government uh, as well, uh, you didn't say equal representation, but clearly you were looking for gender equality. And looking at what a difference that makes, taking into account what uh, Arnie shared with us, which is that you don't, you don't see the difference specifically from women individuals, but from the diversity that comes into the boardroom. Can you comment further on that? Yeah, and I, I would actually like to build on, because I think Arne made a very good point. It's always dangerous when we start talking about women versus men, both because we can stereotype and also we can shut down the ears of one or the other. Uh, and I think the dialogue is so important because the whole gender conversation is really about economic progress. And I think we have come to recognize that nations that tap into the women workforce are the nations that have the highest economic growth and the most prosperity in the world. So we are all recognizing uh, that this is an important part of economic progress. However, we sit in the Western world, I mean here in the US, uh, and we can't even get it right at home. Uh, we have um, managed without quotas or law to get to about 16% uh, maximum women on boards of major corporations, and then uh, we expect uh, the developing world to learn from us. Uh, I think we have to step up our game. We don't. We have to look at diversity from a lot more um, aspects than just gender, skills, and experience, and age, and and, and all of that. But gender is the low-hanging fruit, and, and and we know it's good for commerce. And we know, in addition, that it brings progress on social, environmental, and governance uh, fronts. So why wouldn't we just say, let's get on with it. This progress is too slow. Let's work on quotas and really build inclusive cultures and change the world that way. And I'm glad you brought up the subject of incentives. 
because you do look at your region of the world uh, and others where quotas have been uh, instituted, and you see the results, the, the, the progress and the reports are there, and yet there is still a resistance, particularly uh, in the Western world, to those kinds of incentives. So, but the subject is there, Arnie. Uh, your feeling about incentives, quotas, or any other kind of regulatory action that um, incentivizes the progress? Well, in a company like Marriott, we can do things within our own world to incentivize progress, uh, and, and we do. So, so the, the uh, gender diversity, women's empowerment, is the global common thread of our diversity agenda. Uh, our diversity efforts started in the United States, of course, we're a native United States company. Uh, probably initially the focus was on race. Uh, as we've grown globally, we've said, what does the diversity agenda look like around the world? The world, as we all know, is a complicated place with different legal requirements sometimes, different cultural uh, milieu sometimes. Uh, but what we found in that work was women's empowerment was the common theme that applied in most parts of the world. Uh, and so we've elevated that across our company and said to every one of our business leaders around the world and to their teams, uh, we would like you to set targets around women's empowerment, uh, hiring, leadership, supply chain, uh, customers, all of those things uh, that are measurable, that we can come back and look at regularly over the course of the year. Uh, and that each one of those individual leaders can say, all right, in India, this means X. It means working with the Mahindra School and uh, building on associate hiring. In Rwanda, it may be a partnership with a, a girls' school there and some efforts to create new supply uh, partners that are women-owned. Uh, in other places, it might be a very different agenda. Uh, but let each of those folks in their environment say, this is what that agenda means here. We will erect goals that we can measure. Uh, we can then, from the corporate headquarters, essentially say, how are you doing against those goals uh, and continue to move forward. We don't then depend on the government setting quotas, uh, which is complicated. It may be essential to get some, some of this change taking place, particularly at the, at the highest levels, but that's a government policy question which we're not going to wait for. Dr. For Jacobs, do you have a comment? An opinion about quotas or incentives? I'm not uh, ever in favor of quotas, but internally one should be looking, seeing how well we're doing, how might we be able to do better, and we do pass numbers around within the company, metrics of various kinds, to see how we're doing. I mentioned that we're only in the order of 18% or so women engineers. I think the world is changing in a way that that, in fact, is going to go up in that, in our industry, uh, mobile, uh, we're going more and more in the direction of two significant trends. Mobile health, using cell phones both with sensors to make the various measurements on one's body and pass that information on, and mobile education, that is using virtual classrooms, using a whole range of new approaches, including MOOCs, that uh, will help provide education worldwide. The positive aspect of that is these are both areas that I think women are very interested in, and so hopefully we will end up with a much better balance going forward. Just a couple of more comments on, on incentives, because in your part of the world, Hala, we have seen it work. There was resistance, however. Do you think that the, the reports that are now coming out after a year or so of the quotas being put into place uh, are making a difference? Because you see now the action is voluntary in terms of adding women to boardrooms and to corporate management. Yeah, and just to be clear, I started up being exactly like uh, most people against quotas because, of course, you want to sit around the boardroom table without it, and I was lucky enough to have those opportunities. Of course, you want to get there because of your merit. But I have just come to learn that after, well, Norway put quotas, and in Iceland, we actually made a voluntary agreement. I was part of that to try to re get there on our own. And we made it from 12% to 25% on our own, and now the law has been put into place. So we are not making, we cannot seem to get much beyond tokenism 
without the quota or specific affirmative action. Now, I am a very much a believer that companies should set their own targets and do all of that, but we don't seem to be making progress. And I think if the commercial data is there and the economic data is there, and we also know there's these added benefits of women bringing different things to the table, and we know corporations have to step up to make the positive impact that's needed in the world, why wouldn't we do it? You make more money, uh, you make uh, triple bottom line, is what I like to call it. You know, you make economic profit, and you make a positive impact on the people and, and the planet as well. Why wouldn't you want to do that um, if the other model hasn't worked better than put us into a financial crisis that seems to linger, at least in my view and in Europe? Sheikha Lubna, you have said you don't feel that that is uh, quotas are the right way for the UAE to go. Can you talk about why? I'm not in favor of quotas because I think um, if the system mandates a requirement uh, with the usage of quotas, um, companies, uh, organizations, government entities will start placing women as window dressing where they are not effective. Um, I'm a firm believer that consciously the change of putting women in the right place in organizations and supporting them to succeed has to be inherent in the system and the culture of the organization from the top. Um, so to me, sometimes uh, quotas had worked in the Scandinavian countries, but that doesn't necessarily mean it had worked everywhere. Um, so that's a point. Second, a lot of people always ask about you know, mandating women in the Middle East or Islamic countries. There are more women in politics in terms of leading countries in the Islamic world than there are from the West. And sometimes people tend to forget that. Um, you look around, whether in history in India, Pakistan, Indonesia, uh, you look at Bangladesh, women have always risen to positions of uh, head of states in these, uh, in these countries, but people never look at them. Now, my third point, and this is really back to you, um, Hala, um, I am a firm believer that you put women in a place and she can succeed. But uh, aren't we not being conscious about while we do this, we have to make sure that um, a man or a woman is still at home raising children. You can replace a CEO, but you can't replace a mother or a father at home. Um, you can change, you can sack somebody, but at home, the essence of growing a, a full generation requires someone. In any society, um, while you progress or you want women to take on to 100% uh, uh, participation, um, that we also have to be conscious that the, the, the men are willing and they're accepting that also there's a part at home that they should participate. So we can't work on one part and not the other. It's an integral part of the society we've... Would you well, like right. to respond, Hala? Uh, Dr. Jacobs, I'll give you a chance to uh, let's let Hala respond. No, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I left yesterday to come here and it was my daughter's 10-year-old birthday. I know balance between work and life very well on my own skin and it's not always easy. But I also am blessed with a husband who understands that it is not just the woman's role to raise the kids. And, and they are blessed with having a father who also is part of their life. And it isn't just about me. So, is yes, that I'm... so a slow bro progress, you think? <laughs> you keep talking about women uh, participation in the society being not fast enough. But what about the other side? It's is not that slow or is that fast? It is slow. But I think the Nordics in many ways may lead a more egalitarian social and capital system in many ways. Although I will say, I just moved to Denmark. Denmark because that's actually the lowest performing country in Europe in terms of women on boards. So the Nordics also have a challenge with this. I'm just impatient and the reason I've come to this place is I believe we don't have endless time to fix the things that need to be fixed. And while I have great faith in political systems, or I, I would like to say I have greater faith, I think business needs uh, to step up to move the dial on sustainability. And I think putting gender balanced boardrooms, top management teams together is going to step up the game on sustainability. And I believe it creates the profit, so why not? I would like to move the conversation uh, one step, and, and Dr. Jacobs, perhaps you were going here, and if not, I'll ask you to think about this. Because this question you raised, Sheikha Lubna, which is on the minds of men and women, certainly, is finding the right balance while we're also trying to find the right balance in the workplace to produce the most productive, prosperous global economy for all. Women, in many cases now, in every part of the world, are leaving the corporate ladder, finding those barriers still intact and difficult, and are going into more entrepreneurial routes, both for better balance with their family and also because it's a better balance of what they want to do. How are companies like Qualcomm responding to that challenge 
uh, supporting women-owned businesses, looking for ways in which you can bring individual entrepreneurial women into the global economy in a more effective way? Well, for, let me just go back to the previous issue with the balance in the family. And corporations can make a difference there. And flexible hours, trying to allow work at home, uh, telecommuting type of approaches, uh, encouraging families to come visit, understand what the workplace is all about, and hopefully then having more women see what the father or mother is doing and become interested in engineering. So the, there are indeed things that uh, uh, can be done. As far as uh, encouraging entrepreneurship, I mentioned our wireless reach program. We have a number of educational efforts. We also uh, have programs where we make investments in startups. And so a lot of the startups now, I had mentioned earlier, have to do with areas of telemedicine. And a number of those are areas where women are quite interested. And so we've been encouraging that, providing support. For example, when we have a conference like this, there's often uh, demonstration areas. And so we'll invite some of those small companies in to demonstrate their products and help them grow. Arnie, you have a comment very quickly about Marriott's role here. Well, uh, we have, uh, we're of course making a commitment here at CGI around uh, women suppliers. Uh, we think about 10% of all the stuff we buy in the United States is by women suppliers today, about a quarter of a billion dollars. It's not enough and it needs to be global. Uh, and that's something that, again, we depend on our teams to push. Um, just sort of one comment about uh, balance. I, th I think for us, this is still, uh, it's a global issue, including in the United States and including in our boardroom and in the senior ranks of the company. But in many respects, it turns us on most uh, when you get to the ground and you look at uh, folks in sub-Saharan Africa or folks in India. I don't know how many people read the story of the, uh, in the journal yesterday about the, the uh, woman spouse of one of the convicted rapists and how complicated her life is. But you know, we're, we are compelled to act by the size of the opportunity and the issue. But we're inspired to act by the individual stories and the individual lives that are changed. Uh, and those, those changes are most profound when you hear from a first time regularly employed associate how grateful they are to have a job that they can go to and then start to wrestle with, okay, now how much time do I get with my kids? And before they never got to wrestle with that question. Let's let them all wrestle with it. And we will continue to wrestle with the questions of how we um, find and engage and promote women to become decision makers in the global economy. But I want to thank each of you for being here today and for the efforts and also for the way in which you personally represent the difference uh, that women decision makers and the men who promote and engage them and stand behind them and support them. Thank you very much. And that certainly is advice that all members of CGI can take back to their companies and countries. Thank you.